Hello, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. It's great to see so many of you in the room today. My name is Samantha Simmons, and I'm going to be hosting and moderating this afternoon's sessions. The first one, Saudi Arabia, a destination of the future, putting sustainability first. Please welcome to the stage Fahad Hamidadin, CEO of the Saudi Tourism Authority. Good afternoon. It's wonderful being with you here, particularly at tough times during a post-COVID era. Um, I think our commitment to the sector is not by just being here, but being the most to invest in conversations and partnerships that we lead together. I would like to first thank the WTM for standing solid strong at these times and say we're with you and because we believe that our commitment to the sector is, should never be questioned. Our ambitions are high and we are seeing far. And maybe uh, Isaac Newton said, if I've seen far, it's because I stood on the shoulders of the giants. We look at you as partners, as those giants. You're the movers and shakers of this industry. I here, unlike my fellow colleague panelists, I represent government. They don't. So I think the best job for government business is to get out of business, rather enable and empower. So we're here for that commitment. And I think if there is any lesson we've learned from the pandemic, is not only that we are interconnected, but we're interdependent. We've seen governments taking decisions and talking at businesses rather than talking to them, if not listening to them. We've seen government entities working on destinations independently, and there is no destination that can do it on its own. We've all seen initiatives here and there, and Mother Nature gave us 18 months to think. Now it's time for us to, talk, to walk. Stop talking and do the walking. We're here as a sentiment to that. And about the destination, I don't want to say much because I think we have panelists that will be talking about what they're doing. However, I would like to say that the ambition is big. We have set a goal of 100 million visits by the end of 2030. And we don't want to do this behind numbers. We want to do this behind impact. And the impact is on residents first. Tourism is probably reframed with sustainability. It's not just tourists, it's residents, and maybe residents first. For that, we're trying to build a leading destination. However, engineering that uh, development comes with the consideration of the four imperatives, social, cultural, economical, and environmental. And maybe that would be a good segue to, to, to expand on the conversation and show you how. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Please do take a seat, Farhad. As we continue, um, please let me welcome to the stage our other panelists. Please do join us here to carry on this conversation. John Pagano, CEO of the Red Sea Development Company and Amala. John is creating the development, which is a unique luxury and environmentally regenerative tourism destination. John, welcome. Uh, also joining us is Jerry Inzarillo, CEO of the Diria Gate Development Authority. Um, Jerry is restoring. Please do clap. Thank you. Jerry is restoring and reimagining the ancestral home of the original Saudi state uh, into one of the world's greatest gathering places. And it will include hospitality, education, religious offices, um, all with the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Al Taraf at its center point. Uh, also joining us virtually is Amir Hamad Al Hamadini, who leads the creation of the world's largest open museum. There he is, we can see him there, with the world's heritage site of Hagra at its heart. Welcome to you. Thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So let's begin by uh, asking about net zero, because it's, I mean, if ever there was a topic to be talking about that, it is, of course, this week with COP26 happening in Glasgow, the world's att attention very much on that. Um, tell me, first of all, Farhad, how will the Giga projects set the benchmark, do you think? So the, the advantage that we have, so let's start with the advantage, is that we're building greenfield. 
And um, the, uh, when the pandemic came, I think it, it gave us all a point to sit and reflect at a global level. And there was a lot of learning captured at the time. When Saudi Arabia led the G20 was, uh, in last year, we invited, um, obviously, heads of states. But it was very clear that the tourism was missing in the room. There was no, there were T20, there was heads of states, and there was T20 on, sorry, finance 20, you have trade 20, but there was no tourism 20. So we realized that the tourism, as it contributes to economic growth, SMEs, liveliness, livelihood, it also contributes 8% of the total commission, um, carbon com uh, em uh, emissions. And it's not being addressed. So raising the profile and giving it the right uh, weight at the head of state discussion, I think was the starting point. And we created um, um, you know, a conversation uh, between governments and businesses. And out of that came Al Ula framework, which probably Amr with us can, can also expand on. But that is a framework of building sustainable destinations. Now, sustainability obviously changes from a place to another based on the location. So I'm sure John can talk about the regenerative um, tourism re um, and what, what they're doing, the fantastic work they're doing. So we have a greenfield. We, our, our Ministry of Tourism is leading the global conversation. It's, we just announced, with the Net Zero, we also announced a global sustainability center. Our job is to, as a tourism board in SDA, is to bring, generate the, the demand and appreciation for what we have to offer, starting with protecting and preserving what's authentic in Saudi Arabia. Okay, thank you. Amir, can you expand on that? I think uh, the agenda has been set for sustainability at the top level national here in Saudi Arabia with the Crown Prince um, endorsing in the sustainability green, uh, uh, Saudi Green Initiative um, that Saudi Arabia reliance on green energy to offset the impact of fossil fuel and combat climate change is going to happen and a net zero carbon emission will take place by 2060. I think for us, a circular bioeconomy and the role of sustainability is essentially a business model. As you can see in the background here, Arula sustained its success through a thriving oasis. It provided the bedrock for all civilizations to come exchange and travel. And that system is being challenged today. Uh, destructive and disruptive infrastructure practices that are not sustainable for water management will make it to go away. And if it goes away, economy goes away and the whole ancient civilization oasis will stop to thrive. Going green for us and being sustainable is not a choice. It's really the only way forward. And I think it's no longer a competition. Economy and environment are actually at the core business of future tourism, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, Jerry, you're in charge of this huge $20 billion giga project. Tell us about how that fits in with sustainability and the benchmark here. Yeah, thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's always a great honor to be with Fahad and John and Hamid and uh, also uh, Amr, my dear uh, colleagues. Today is very special because today is the birthplace of the kingdom. So 300 years ago, when the settlers came into this historic oasis, Wadi, they built a village out of mud where 30,000 people lived. So that was the center of culture and heritage. Very important. The birthplace of the kingdom, the birthplace of the Arabian Peninsula, and the house of Al Saud. So sustainability is unbelievably important to what Fahad said, which is to protect the authenticity of the culture and heritage. Now, as a result of that, we're not a theme park. We're the, we're the birthplace of the kingdom. Now, I'm all for theme parks, and we're building one of the most amazing giga projects in the world called Gedea that will entertain the society. Our mandate is culture and heritage. But to, to keep it pristine, the UNESCO World Heritage Site, we're building a 10-kilometer, $50 billion master plan. But in order to do that, we had to build a whole city under the mud city with all new sustainability and all new water, electric, irrigation. What the Crown Prince said that all of us were so happy last week about Green Saudi and Green Riyadh, DGDA, DGDA, we've already planted 
over 3 million plants, trees, shrubs. We've already planted 22,000 palm trees. So the quality of life just in today and now is really what it should be in the vision of the crown prince. So it's very fragile because we're the birthplace of the kingdom. It's a city made out of mud, but the sustainability goes hand in hand. They're not separate. Yeah, and John, regeneration, sustainability, very much at the heart of what you're doing. It is, and uh, thank you. Um, and it's good to be back in East London, having spent most of my career out here. Um, I think, I'm mean, going to say some things that are potentially controversial. I think net zero is great, but it's not enough. <laughs> Sustainability is no longer enough. What we're trying to do, and I'm very proud of, of Saudi Arabia because they're taking some very bold steps, both in terms of Saudi Green Initiative, you know, planting 10 billion trees. Net zero is about sort of maintaining the status quo, not adding more to the, to, the, to the environment. Planting 10 billion trees is about sequestering more carbon. At the very heart of the Red Sea, regeneration is about going beyond sustainability. I liken sustainability to not making a mess of the place, whereas regeneration is, at its heart, is trying to make the place better than when we first arrived. So we're trying to use the power of tourism. Now, tourism is everybody in this room will recognize and understand it, is probably one of the most important economic sectors globally. Over 10% of global GDP, it employs one in 10 people worldwide. So it has huge transformative power. And what we're using the Red Sea platform to do is really to show the world and lead the world to a better way. So, you know, we do the things that everybody should do as a matter of course. You know, sending zero waste to landfill, no zero, zero single-use plastics, those are, should be st straightforward and simple. But we're going to be the largest tourism destination in the world, powered 100% by renewable energy. Now, you know, we, that's amazing. And people can do it. The technology exists. But we're off grid. We're going to install the largest battery storage system in the world to, in order to fulfill our ambition to be totally off grid. Um, as I said, the technology exists today. All that's lacking is the will. Now, if we take these bold steps, every one of us in this industry takes those bold steps incrementally, the total is going to help us achieve not only net zero, but actually beyond. Let's plant more trees. Let's plant, plant more mangroves. You know, let's restore nature. Nature-based solutions are going to be part of the, the solution to this problem. Um, and we really need to do it by actions and not just simply words. Yeah, I guess also everyone's trying to realign their expectations to what people now want post-pandemic, and there's going to be a shift, isn't there? How will the projects in Saudi Arabia fit in with what consumers want post-pandemic, Farhad, do you think? First, I want to say, I don't think everybody gets how important the tourism sector today. Believe it or not, many people reduce the sector to airlines and hospitality. What uh, John talked about is the real impact of that moving market that affects infrastructure, transportation, you name it, retail, FMB, and primarily, primarily jobs and SMEs. So, so that's one. I think it's very important to give the right frame and definition for the sector. As far as what consumers are looking for, I think you and I are travelers. So, Samantha, what would you want? I mean, what I would assume is that safety, clarity, and, uh, and a destination that is inspiring enough for me to go to. So make it easy and, make, and keep it safe. And um, I have to say that Saudi Arabia has done a marvelous job being amongst the first to integrate its um, um, vaccination app with the IATA Pass, with other international organizations, integrated digitally. Um, today, we have over 60% uh, uh, double vaccinated uh, population. Our agenda is open, our borders are open with wide arms and hearts. So, um, so yeah, but I, I would also like to talk about uh, a point in regards to putting the talk into tests and practice. Sustainability to some people is becoming a word that agitates them. And they call it the S word. Stop bringing up the S word. Everybody talks about sustainability, very few actually do something about it. And in particularly in tourism, if we don't put a price tag to carbon, I think this will always remain be good talk. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk a bit more about all of your individual projects. Um, and tell us more about the standout features of each project in terms of global first when it comes to responsible tourism. Amo, if I can start with you. 
Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I echo the idea that sustainability is not enough. Uh, in Al-Ula, we are lucky to have 55,000 population around us and regeneration is at the core of how we believe we can realize a sustainably growing um, uh, economy. And it takes a system of interventions here at uh, Al-Ula uh, to get this right. And the UNTWO, the uh, adopted Al-Ula framework, realized that. From sustainable approach to planning, it starts with a good clarity in the master plan. How can you lay the rules of the game through proper zoning, proper approach to mobility, quality of life components that make environment part of how people enjoy ancient um, and natural uh, surrounding? It is ingrained by the plan. It's the right code, the right material, the right waste management plan, etc. But that doesn't work alone. We need to restore the ecological system we have from understanding the flora and fauna, understand the relationships that can lead one day to an ecosystem that is in balance, allowing wildlife to come back again without being uh, pumped up by uh, human interventionists. The food chains are correct, the micro uh, um, uh, environments are, are healthy, but that's again not alone. And I, I really focus on that regeneration that John has highlighted, an inclusive and sustainable community development by investing in the people you have in the community around you, they become the best guardians. And the fourth arm is to make sure visitors feel it. Because if they are inspired by the past, by the ancient kingdoms, by the assets you have, they will be highly likely inspired to preserve it. And if you get it right, you get an ecosystem that plays to the advantage of sustainability, being a friend of the development and not an S-word. <laughs> The S word, it's going to follow us all around for a long time, isn't it? Um, and I can see why it does aggravate some people, but I think it's one that we're not going to be able to escape. Um, John, tell us about some world first for you guys. Well, I, can't, I go back to where I started with, you know, the, I'm, I'm not going to use the S word because I've said <laughs> it's, not, it's not good enough. We're going to the R word. Um, the, some of the world first, I mean, I've already touched on the, you know, the renewable energy and all the rest of this stuff, but I want to go right to the very beginning and the essence of the Red Sea. So I tell people that the first people that we employed to look at the Red Sea weren't the architects. We actually employed the scientists. We brought science into our thinking right from the very beginning. We partnered with the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology to understand the unique environment within which we were planning to develop a tourism destination without any pre pre preconceived ideas as to what that destination would be like. We then worked with them to create the largest marine spatial planning exercise ever undertaken. And what that entailed was basically looking at, and in particular, the marine environment. We looked at our entire destination and we carved it all up into many, many thousands of squares and assigned a conservation value to each and every one of them. And then we iterated the plans. We tried different locations, you know, building uh, resorts in different locations, and we, you know, ran the analysis each and every time. And the objective wasn't the S word, maintaining the status quo. We set ourselves the goal of actually increasing the net conservation value of the destination by 30% over the coming decades. Now, what that means is, we're going to improve the destination. So increasing mangroves, increasing coral reefs. We're, we're blessed. We have the fourth largest coral reef system in the world, but it's also probably the only one that is still thriving and healthy. And we're using that as a, as a, you know, a real inspiration for ourselves to really understand that, to maybe perhaps offer some hope to the rest of the world. And if we can learn why our corals are more resilient to the threats that that damage them elsewhere, higher temperatures, et cetera. You know, if we can share that knowledge, can we restore the Great Barrier Reef? Can we restore the Caribbean reefs? So that's one of the things that I'm particularly proud of, that, again, we took the scientific approach first. The, 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 the economics, the, the profitability almost played a secondary, a secondary role. Well, I'll finish off by talking about my favorite subject, which is my turtles. Um, you know, we are protecting the natural habitats of turtles. We found a beautiful island that we would have developed but for the work that we did. It was, it's absolutely beautiful, but it's also a favored nesting ground for the hawksbill sea turtle, which is critically endangered. So I developed the island, I make a lot of money. 
happy days. I develop the island, I potentially accelerate the extinction of the species. Not such a happy day. So we chose to set that island apart. Indeed, we set more than three quarters of the islands aside, which will never develop, because they are critical to the ecosystem, to the, you know, the, the health of our, of our planet. Biodiversity is as important as carbon sequestration, and the two do not go you know, without being connected to one another. In a way, you're really fortunate that you are, don't get to repeat the awful mistakes that so many countries have made because they didn't know the damage that could be caused. So you are in a fortunate position, I guess. Um, Jerry, what about you? What about the responsible um, tourism that you're going to introduce that others can learn from? Yeah, I see we feel equally blessed uh, for a cultural and historic point of view. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the custodian of the two holy mosques, His Majesty the King, was governor of Riyadh for many years. But what a lot of people don't know about him is that he's a very devout, devout historian. Um, he is someone that when you engage with him and walk, he will be so happy to see you and tell you stories about your grandfather, your father. Now, why is that important? Because in Derea, he started the, the restoration of this living city in 1998. I had the privilege of visiting in 1998 to study it. But what John said is very interesting, and here's where we give credit to the Crown Prince. The Crown Prince said, in areas that we are expert on, we're going to seek the most expert Saudi talent and match it with expertise that we currently don't have in the world in terms of marketing and tourism while we ramp up and, and attract the young, talented uh, people like uh, Fahad and the people uh, in the different ministries. Why is this important? Because when we started at Tadea, we did not start with the architects or the urban planners. We started with the archaeologists, the anthropologists, and the historians because we didn't want to mess with a living, breathing city. You see, so the Acropolis to the Greeks, the Colosseum to the Romans, Chichen Itza, uh, Machu Picchu, we're, we're not bringing Derea back to life. It's always been there, so we have to protect it. So even three years ago, four years ago, before people really talked about sustainability, the crown prince was hip to it already there. All the CEOs, every one of us, it's been in our mindset for every day. Now, the thing that's beautiful about the kingdom is we've been around a long time. We've seen where tourism has complemented its communities, its countries, and we've seen where we pushed it too far. So now you could say that the kingdom got into tourism a little bit later, but we learned not to make those same mistakes in one of the physically most beautiful countries in the world with authentic culture and heritage. So each, the Saudi Ministry of Tourism, Saudi Ministry of Culture, each of the Giga projects, we hold what we have dear, and, we, and, and it's important. What, one final comment, what Amr said about his beloved community at Al Lula. 14% of my staff, and it's, we're coming up on 2,000 people in the new year, are from the community we serve today. So when we put all the trees and cleaned all things up, and we, we've already, not now, not 2030, we put in seven kilometers of sidewalk, street, lights. Now you see the mothers and the families with the baby carriages, people on bicycles running. This is quality of life. This is good stuff. And the crown prince was hip to it, even when he became crown prince, thanks to the, the, uh, the example set by the custodian. Well, let's talk a bit more about giving back, because I know it's something that's very important to you, Farhad. We've heard a few examples there of how, Jerry, John, you've been giving back and seeing your projects give back to the community and to nature. Tell us a bit more about that. I think um, they're developing something new. Uh, when you look at the total destination, start with your, with your residents. And I think we're absolutely blessed by being a capital of youth in the region. Um, 70% 70, uh, 70 of our population is below the age of 35. Just think about that. What Saudi Arabia is going through, and I'm sure many people listen to all the stories they hear from Saudi and wonder, is it what I've always known about Saudi? It sounds a little different. How different? How credible is what they're saying? The truth is, Saudi in the past five years skipped two generations. Literally skipped two generations. In terms of? In terms of 
age. In many countries, in many um, you know, leadership of countries, you see a challenge of representation, maybe not geography, gender, ethnic group, sexual orientation, but you see a representational challenge of youth. Youth is not in the room. Here, we see youth taking charge. What they bring is the ambition, is the dynamism, the creativity, and the, the perseverance, uh, per perseverance. And I think time always rewards that. Now, too many would assume that what we're doing is because of the luxury of budget. I'll tell you why I believe it's not. One, I believe doing good will always reward you on business. And that's, that's I think, the leadership uh, vision and that we all believe in. But starting today is, means starting with our human capital. The training programs we're doing has been nothing but second to none. The empowerment of women. Samantha, look at the first line and maybe this, the, the second line in this, in this room. 70% of, of the audience here are representing the entities we all work in. And in the lady in white here in the first row is the Vice Minister of Tourism. She's the highest rank after the minister. She is, she is an embodiment of what Saudi is going through. She's a graduate of LBS and, and much more. I don't want to reduce her to LBS. I give her more credit than that. But I'd also like to acknowledge London's contribution into what is happening in this movement. But you have, I have 43% of my total organization women. And the average age is 32 across the total organization. This is what the new Saudi Arabia is. And, it's, um, and it's, uh, if we're not giving back to our people first, there is no point of giving back to any. Thank you. Well, let's talk a bit more about leadership and best practice and collaborating. Um, tell us, we'll go to Amma, to you on that. Tell us what you're doing to bring others in and bring them along. Uh, thank you very much. I think we're all joining, uh, luckily, in, in, in this time of uh, development in Saudi Arabia by clarity of vision. And I think a leader who cannot propose clarity of vision loses a lot of momentum among people and that we have sorted for us. Uh, today we enjoy um, young leadership, inspire people who believe that this time is special for Saudi Arabia. The largest archaeological program in the world today is actually running in Al-Ula, and I believe that the largest the renaissance of heritage conservation in terms of knowledge created for the global uh, community is going to happen from Saudi Arabia for the next years to come. Opportunities, development, real challenges, real driven uh, targets is what people need to be inspired. And I think defining the challenge very well and supporting people to grow, uh, to deliver is what leadership demands. We enjoy today an organization that's coming up um, very successfully delivering on its phase zero. Our phase zero is a $2 billion program that's concluding by end of December, a total revamp and expansion of an airport that has done all what we need is done for that. The building of world-class um, concert hall called Maraya, the restoration of the cultural heritage oasis. Um, a lot more is, is up against us uh, to the future. And uh, we hope that we can participate to open the world to new tourism that we call authentic, authentic luxury. Jerry, John, would you like to add to that? Well, I think yeah. I'm, I'm going to pick up on some of the things both both Amr and uh, Fahd mentioned. I think for me, you know, my decision to come and be part of this was not about the project as much as it was, it was, as it was about the people. And when I got to know the people who are now my colleagues, I was, I was taken by their passion, their enthusiasm for where their country was heading, led by a charismatic leader who has a clarity of vision, as Amr said. So to me, that was the, the thing that ultimately sold the deal. Um, I'd done big projects. I developed Canary Wharf, so you know, that's a pretty sizable uh, you know, undertaking. The thing that was most important to me was really the contribution to helping to uplift you know, a society and really allow them to fulfill their ambitions. And, and that was really the thing for me. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think all of us uh, here principally because we did, um, the kingdom did an amazing job in hosting the G20, as you covered so well. And um, in over 200 interviews, the most common question asked of me uh, as an American that has lived in dozens of countries, 
what's, what's your favorite thing about Saudi Arabia? And I, I said, it's a very easy answer. Um, the positivity. Uh, you, you, every day you come to work, and uh, in, in our particular case, we're 81% Saudi, 36% blessed with superstar Saudi women, 16% of my Saudi women colleagues are in management, as I said, 14% of our staff are from Dedea. Our average age is 31. You take me out, it's probably 24. <laughs> um, but, but everybody's fired up. And you have, because of the crown prince, you have a, a, a unified positivity in the whole country. You have a national positivity that, that has been dispersed in the G20. But here's the thing about aspirations. You hear a lot about 2030, 2030. Didea is one of the first giga projects in the world that starting 2022 delivers assets. So we'll be able to, not for just our community and for all of our uh, Saudi beloved residents, but we will allow people to see the rich cultural heritage. We will open, groundbreak, and announce new assets every year starting 22, 23, 24. First hotel under construction, first museum of nine under construction. We'll open 20 new restaurants. We'll plant one million trees. We will have one of the largest urban gardens, the Wadi Anifa, in the world by the end of 24. So if you think it's aspirational for 2030, um, you know, someone said to me uh, last week, you look tired. <laughs> I, you said to, you look I said to him, do you know who my boss is? <laughs> Everybody, because, but, but everybody's charged because of the positivity of, of the, the, the Saudi society. Can I, can I add to that? Because I think you know, what you say is, is, is true. I mean, it is aspirational. 20, you know, this is an ambitious nation with great goals, but it's happening today. It's not happening right. tomorrow. Correct. We will open our first resorts at the Red Sea next year. Right, see? And the year after, the end of 2023, we will complete our first phase, which includes 16 hotels, 3,000 hotel rooms, residences, a new airport, a new town, for 14,000 people who are going to live and work at the destination, right. plus all of this brand new infrastructure setting a new standard of renewable energy never been undertaken before on this scale. So it's not tomorrow, it is actually today, today. and we're you know, delighted to be able to welcome you all as early as next year to come and visit and explore. Saudi is open <laughs> now, but he's talking about the Red Sea project. And I think maybe if I may add, uh, Samantha, the, uh, our doors are open today, and we're seeing the numbers increasing every week. Thanks to one of our festivals in Riyadh and then another festival in El Ula, we're seeing the numbers uh, simply um, quadrupling in the coming few weeks. And just to give you an, an example of what youth and the now point of, of uh, John is, we started you know, right after pandemic to go with iconic festivals. The Riyadh season is just one festival, I think it's like World Cup of entertainment. Usually World Cup is all about, you know, 10 stadiums, every stadium attracts tens of thousands for a soccer match once a week or so. We're talking about 13 zones, each zone attracts up to 100 and, uh, not each, but some attract 150,000 every, every day. And just to give it a scale, one of the events is Rave, con Rave, Rave Music Festival. In year one, in 2019, we launched it. People thought Saudi, EDM, rave, really? Guess what? In day one, we had 403,000 visitors in the first version. We had 30 DJs. This year, we have 90. And, um, and we're just saying, if you think this is it, you haven't seen a thing. I'm sure you're all big fans of the Rave Festival. We expect <laughs> to see you all there next year. <laughs> now, with so much going on, Tell us about accountability. Um, does the buck stop with you, with all of this construction, both before, during, after? <laughs> it does with me. Yeah, <laughs> of course. I mean, me. We're responsible. And, the, and what's extraordinary about the Crown Prince is that he's our chairman in each of these projects. And he approves every rendering. We have to report to him monthly. And the biggest KPI is the development of our Saudi colleagues. The next is, are you on time? 
We're not going to break our promises to our society. So the, uh, in terms of does the buck stop with are we responsible for what we're given? You know the old saying, to whom much is given, much is expected? He will give it to you. He will give you the trust. He'll give you the resources. And now it's up to us to make sure that that vision is fulfilled. So I feel, you know, I, I feel that responsibility to, uh, to not let anybody down and to make sure that everybody gets to see beautiful today. Now you I, for one, I have a live dashboard. I don't report on a master plan. Live dashboard. I don't know how many inbound visitors <laughs> coming, and I get questions on WhatsApp. What's the explanation? So talk about accountability. Uh, I mean, that's a torture test of accountability. <laughs> There's no Seriously. sleep for you. <laughs> you actually know, uh, then you know my lifestyle. <laughs> I can imagine. He's at the raves, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> don't pick on me. Ge gearing up for the raving, absolutely. Um, now, you're learning so much as you go along, and I'm sure you will want to impart as well some of that knowledge to others, especially about these giga projects in terms of best practice. I'm a, I think Amir wants to come in as well. I can see you there. Yes. Was it something you wanted to add, or do you want to answer that question? You're muted. ...the issue, because you wonder what inspires people, and you think it's a vision. It's actually a vision with measurable milestones and outcomes where you can actually go back and know you've delivered. And I think one thing when joined Saudi Arabia today, that yes, a vision is hard to put together, but a roadmap that is measurable and, you know, transparently reported on is to me actually what takes a nation and that we enjoy as well. And as all the, my colleagues on stage said, we do have to fulfill our promises and that is the fun of this game, of this game and journey. That's all I wanted to have. Man. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's talk a bit more about um, best practice and what other people can learn from what you're doing around the world. Who wants to come in on that one? I'll leave it to you. I'll start on that one. Um, I think, especially post-COVID, we knew this before COVID, but people are looking for human interaction. They're looking for authenticity. I think the era of fake and make-believe, I mean, in, in terms of fantasy, that's never been more important, and that's what gave rise to Disney and all of that. But I think now people are really genuine, genuinely looking for what's real, what moves me, and then human interaction. Do you see me? Do you hear me? So when you come to a country that is rich and deep, today it was the center of culture and heritage for hundreds of years. Now it will be once again. So um, I think the big thing now is that as a globe, and why sustainability to me is imperative is because I think everybody's realizing now, especially with global conflict, especially in, you know, my controversial subject is where war has destroyed cultural heritage um, and the eradication of uh, cultural expression, dance, music, food. It's so rich in Saudi that we just want to make sure that it stays, it's preserved, and that people can enjoy it without overrunning it. Okay, thank you. Can I add to that? Um, that human interaction is scientifically measured as the most, that gets the highest recall of any trip you take to any destination. Let me give you a couple of stories. I, without giving names, I, I personally invited one of the editors-in-chief, who is a lady of, um, of a publication related to tourism. She came and she toured the country on day five, um, I was told that she broke in tears. And she said, I can't believe how judging I was before I came. Another story of a lady that just left Saudi yesterday. One of my colleagues uh, told me that she wanted to come. She's actually the CEO of a travel agency from the US. She said, I don't want to meet any officials. Don't give me the polished presentations. I want to come see the country my myself. She didn't want to meet me or meet any of my, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, official colleagues. So she wanted the tour guide. And she said, I will only use the tour guide when I want. I said, sure, have your own experience. So last night I get a call about how she broke in tears over dinner. I said, what's with, bro <laughs> with breaking in tears? It's becoming a habit. But the truth is, people that travel are agents of good. Whether they say it, they know it, or not, they are. You never travel but for a passion. And that passion comes from your soul. And when you see the people, 
you really get to wonder. And wondering is when you're emotionally engaged, intellectually stimulated, and you start seeing yourself, seeing the world, or seeing the place in a new light. And I can tell you with numbers, the number one driver to our positive NPS in 2019, amongst the 600,000 that visited us, was the Saudi people. They might not be all as polished or as globally, you know, civil as people define civilization, but they are the most genuine and humanly raw. You know, one, one, uh, the crown prince before COVID, when heads of state would come, one of his favorite things is to walk through the mud city of Dedea. So Vladimir Putin came on a state visit. Now, everybody knows that President Putin is very composed in public. You, you rarely see expression from him. But the crown prince walked him through Dedea. And uh, he's very polite, as always, the crown prince, and walked uh, President Putin to the car. And he said to him, what did you think about Dedea? And President Putin said to him, it's small words, but it meant a lot to the crown prince and to us. And he said, it's a very emotional place. Things that are authentic, if you're sophisticated, you know it. If you're unsophisticated, you feel it. And that's where the authenticity comes. So I think, I think Saudi Arabia is going to be a beacon for a renaissance of travel to the Gulf. I think as Saudi tourism uh, kicks into a big time gear now, it will benefit the entire Gulf. And I think it starts changing perceptions of the region. People will gather, they'll start share, they'll see Arabian hospitality, which I've enjoyed for 30 plus years. And that's a good thing because the principal purpose of tourism is ambassadorial. It's welcoming. And I think, I think the kingdom is really in a very sincere way saying, come visit us, you are welcomed and see for yourself. Well, you have quite the ambitious target, 100 million visitors a year you're aiming for. And while you said numbers are quadrupling every week, you're not quite there yet. How do you plan on getting there and when do you hope to reach that target by? So first, let me explain that this is 100 million visits. This is not international inbound only. So this includes our Umrah visits, the spiritual uh, visit or religious travel, including VFR, business, um, as in visit friends and family and, and business and leisure. So we, when we laid out the strategy for the destination, we divided it into two phases. The first phase was in the first three years. Now with the pandemic, we're stretching this to, to four, maybe. Now, the first phase we're calling it Discover Saudi because we realize that the experiences are not all developed. So all these uh, giga projects uh, represented by my colleague panelists are opening doors in the coming couple of years. And that is when we go into the next phase, where that's experience Saudi. And you start seeing growth exponentially. So um, I think um, um, the, um, all I can say is just uh, watch and see. OK. And John, you wanted to come in before, I think. Well, no, I think only to say that we're going to contribute somewhat, somewhat towards that, but not too much. Because as I said at the beginning, you know, we're about working with our environment. We've set ourselves an ecological ceiling of no more than 800,000 to a million visitors for our entire destination so that we stay within our environmental foot, you know, what the environment can actually take. Learning from the past, learning what people have done wrong, you know, we're the direct beneficiaries of that. And uh, so we will try to help Fad achieve his 100 million, but only this much. <laughs> but well, Riyadh, Riyadh will contribute, contribute 27 million towards that. Today, are, not the UNESCO site, because that's pristine. But the master plans will have uh, 7 million of that number to contribute. And the Crown Prince says, you know, the entire um, remaking of Riyadh with the Royal Commission of Riyadh City. But today it will be the jewel in the middle of this um, new uh, G10 metropolis. So all of your projects, um, they are not oven baked yet, they're all still in fruition. Tell us about the time frame for when you expect them to come online and, and be complete. Amir, well, let's start that with you. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much. I think we all share very similar uh, phasing. Our phase one is to be finished by 2023. That's a thousand uh, uh, hospitality qualified keys, a series of cultural assets, including visitor centers to our UNESCO heritage sites and others. and. Um, couple of museums as well. 
but we have all actually taken that job to support the growth agenda of the interest about visiting Saudi Arabia from day one. Most of us, to some extent, have opened door to have people come and experience the sites. Today, we enjoy around 80 to 100,000 people per year in al -Ula. We have already completed phase zero by end of this year. We would be done. Phase two for us is 2030, and that will be around a million and 200 uh, people per uh, year, visits per year. And by the time we complete our program 2035, we would have reached our well-calculated capacity managed 2 million uh, visitors per year. We are a big destination with multiple uh, hubs, and that goes along with our sustainability for the environment, works well as the right number to strike. Can I add to that? So, um, yes, these are new destinations and they're developing in phases. We need not to forget that there is 1.8 mis uh, uh, um, billion Muslims around the world, and there is only one Mecca, one Medina. And these two holy cities are being uh, unpacked, and the total supply chain is going to be freed. It was very much control-driven. I think now tourism with technology has offered a lot of digital convenient controls which allows us to open our doors wide open. So we, that will give us more or less a, a helicopter takeoff. While they ramp up on the runway and you know, take off, I think Umrah, uh, the religious tourism. By the way, it's also important to mention that historically it was just that ritual of two hours experience and then another ritual in Medina. Now we're unpacking the, the birthplace of, of Arabia and as well as the, this religion. Uh, because it left us so many archaeological sites, uh, Islamic sites, that are now open for visitors. So I think that will give us a helicopter takeoff. And plus, for the very first time, we're opening Medina for non-Muslims. It was always so. Just a couple of months ago, we started knocking off those signs that said, for Muslims only. So there is, a, uh, there is an area within Medina that is open for all culturally curious to come and explore what's there. So, the, you know, from a theology point of view, the kingdom is unique because, as I, my beloved colleague said, there is only one Mecca, there is <laughs> only one Medina, but you know what I'm going to say? Culturally, there's only one Derea. I, ha I have to get that in. I knew you were going to come back to I have to get that. that in. Now, I will say on our phasing, uh, our first phase will be done by the end of 24, but we will open assets as, uh, like John is doing in 2022, 23, 24. Then we have a robust second phase that will open. Uh, we're, we're building them parallel uh, by 2026, but uh, you're talking 38 um, uh, hotels, 100 restaurants, two uh, uni major universities, new mosques, uh, beautiful, huge souks, um, 6,000 residences, this is a 9.9 kilometer um, cultural heritage city made out of the Central Arabian Najda architecture, the mud architecture, um, in the middle of what's going to be one of the great metropolises in the world. Okay, I guess that's, there's only one Red Sea. Right. <laughs> there is Just only a, one Red Sea. <laughs> and, we, and, and we own it, <laughs> Jerry. They're not going to move it into Riyadh. Good. Um, so, as I think I previewed, we're opening our first hotels at the end of next year. At the end of 23, we will open 16 in total, so 3,000 rooms. A new town, as I said, for 14,000 people, including hospitals and schools. We're creating a livable destination. So unlike other parts of the world where the people that work in the destination end up in some horrible conditions, this is going to be a, a desirable place to be. So we hope to be able to attract the brightest and the best. Um, the balance of the project, which is 50 hotels and a total of 8,000 rooms, will be developed over, over the coming years with a total completion or an anticipated completion by 2030. Uh, I neglected to mention Amala. Amala is also another giga project that, that is under our responsibility. We have nine hotels under construction right now. We hope to open those at the end of 2024, adding to the hotel count another 1,200 keys. Again, we're building a new town for that destination because of its location. So. By the, by the end of 24, we will add 4,200 4, keys to you know, Saudi Arabia's existing hotel inventory, but you know, at the highest level, I mean, delivering the kind of experience that the modern traveler is going to be looking for, particularly in a post-COVID world where the, it's not going to be overcrowding, it's about being in touch with nature. 
quality, not quantity. Indeed. So. Gentlemen, there, we must leave it. Thank you very much for your time Thank telling you. us more about your projects. Jerry, John, Farhan, of course, Amir, for joining us remotely. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.